the following item has been paid for by the WZWA Network. Hi, everybody. This is former WWE superstar Al Snow. And Bennett. CW Anderson. Sean Oliver. My name is Eugene. And you are watching the Insider's Edge podcast. Now get on the train. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Insider's Edge podcast here on the WCWA Network in conjunction with Blue Wire Hustle. I'm your host with the most on the West Coast, California in theory. A joy to be with you all once again, and I'm excited here. This is a really, uh, the story that, you know, I'm, I'm looking to, to hear about here today is, is a, a rare one, I suppose, in the wrestling business, and really can't wait to, to dig deep and find out a little bit about this guy's journey in life. And without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, my guest at this time, the one and the only Tyler Fullington. How are you, my friend? I'm doing good, man. What's up, everybody? It's uh, great to have you on the show, bro. Um, you know, first question usually for my guests is, you know, how did you become a fan of of wrestling before you got in the business? But because your dad was a, a famous professional wrestler, I guess the first question that I'd like to ask you is, when were you first aware of what your dad did for a living? Oh, wow. So, I mean... I guess I, I guess I was maybe around. So when I got in the business, I was about six or seven years old. So I mean, my first recollections are maybe about a year or so before that, you know. But I mean, I guess at the time I didn't really realize what exactly what you know, professional wrestler like you're going there every day and like, you know, watching them train and stuff like that and having shows and matches and everything like that and. I don't know. I don't know anything different. So I'm just like, oh, you know, he's a professional wrestler. Like, I guess everybody does this. Like, you know, like I, I have no idea. But yeah, I guess I had to have been, I guess, around five years old. And then, you know, it just carried on from there. <laughs> right. Um, so were you actually allowed to watch ECW as a kid at that age? Yeah, I mean, having him as a pet, I mean, I guess they couldn't really keep me from it, you know, so <laughs> I mean, in my, you know, my dad being who he is, I mean, he's always been good. Like, he's just like, hey, listen, kids are eventually going to see it. So it is what, it, you know, I guess I can monitor it. Too, but it is what it is. I was around I was around it every day. So I wasn't, you know, what were they going to find a babysitter for me like five days a week if he was going <laughs> to do his best? You know, it's just it is what it is. It was just part of my life. And I mean, I'm happy I got to experience it. Absolutely. Uh, and as I said earlier, it's, it's such a rare story because it's not often that, you know, uh, kids of that age actually get to be involved in, uh, you know, a product like this on television. Um, how did it get explained to you what exactly was going on? And, and do you remember being pitched the idea of, of being a part of the ECW program, uh, programming with uh, your, your father's feud with Raven? Yeah, so, I mean, I... It was a long time ago. I'm probably not going to uh, be able to say this verbatim, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it was basically somewhere along the lines of they were asking me, like, hey, you know, you want to be part of the show, this, that, and the other thing. And I think they were just asking me to be nice. It was more or less him telling me that I was going to be part of it. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, all this stuff. And then they told me I was, you know, going to get, like, $50 a show and all this other stuff. And I thought it was, like, the greatest idea ever. Obviously, that was a bunch of BS. I wasn't getting paid, but... I think I guess my dad and my mom were paying me, but I wasn't getting paid from them. But at the time, I guess I thought it was. But yeah, the, I mean, because my mom was a part of it, too. So I guess that helped me be like, yeah, I'll do it. You know, if she's doing it. My dad's already doing it, you know, so I guess we're doing this, I get, you know, and it was just there was no like warm ups or like you know, like rehearsals, no nothing. It was just like, hey, this is what you're doing. Like, I'll see you out there. Like, you know, but I, a bunch of a bunch of the guys helped me out, like, every night. I mean, I had my mom out there, obviously. I had my dad out, you know, raving. But, like, the Blue Meanie, Stevie Richards, like, Nova, like, all those guys were making sure that 
I'm in the right spots at the right time, you know, doing all my stuff because those guys were doing like 75 move like finishers. Like there was running and running and running yeah. and running running and this that the other thing and you had to be on time and be i mean sometimes i would get it right but i i got to give a lot of credit to those guys for putting me in the right spots and you know helping me out along the way and then i you know i got better and better as the time went on but you know you're still a six seven year old kid so i need a little bit of direction every now and then i guess absolutely that was the, the most fascinating thing about it for me was like you know it's not like you have acting experience or <laughs> any experience in anything at this point in your life except for you know right. <laughs> kid things but uh so uh, i i guess you know that it was good to know that those guys helped you out with that um it's uh, hardcore heaven on june 22nd 96 uh uh, it's revealed that uh you have <laughs> joined the side of raven uh dressed in his signature out Bit, you know the leather jacket the jean shorts uh accusing your daddy of being a drunk and uh stating that you worship raven <laughs> leaving the sandman tearful this is some heartbreaking television here um <laughs> uh, what was it like working with raven in the angle because i know he's a very smart guy and he always has these ideas he must have been really helpful for you well yeah for sure i mean him him and my dad uh they're actually like both super super intelligent i mean they would sit they would sit in the back and literally play chess like they like talk about reading the newspaper any books like they'd be trying to stump the, each other all the time freaking you know so they're both like super intelligent and raven he's just he's really good i mean obviously i'm with him he's helping me along the way just like i said uh, you know my mom and you know his whole flock and everything but now nah, he's a super intelligent dude very smart like wrestling mind and it was just it was super fun i mean i obviously didn't realize it at the time you know i was just going out there just you know doing whatever but when i look back like watching the work that like we all did and i mean it was definitely compelling stuff like i like i said i didn't realize it at the time because i'm just you know living my life doing whatever you know my parents tell me to do like i'm thinking everybody's like a professional wrestler like you know i have no idea but now when i look back on it like it's definitely some really good stuff that we did there and obviously scotty meaning raven was a huge part of it right um so i mean this this is a, a question i had uh we still go into school and stuff and do the kids at school find out that you were doing all this or because your parents were on the road, you were maybe you'll get being homeschooled. How did that all work? Well, so uh, I was born, I was born uh, outside of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. Um, and I lived there for a lot of my life. And then I was going, going to school and then we moved to Florida uh in tampa bay and clearwater for a couple years and then moved to salt lake city utah for a couple years and it was weird because we would always like i'd be going to school constantly but we'd always be trying to move like during the summer and like do the wrestling thing during the summer so i would be all right and um uh what was i gonna say oh and when when i'm that age i mean none of those kids are like yo i saw you on ecw last night like <laughs> <laughs> you know like i don't know if any of the parents like recognize me or anything like that but no i have not not until like i don't know later when i got like older maybe like around like when i was like 12 or 13 i can look back on it and be like yeah like kids started realizing like kind of who my dad was but like there was a lot of times when i moved i don't know like four or five years in a row that I was never really establishing any friends so I could really be like they could actually realize that my dad was like who he was or anything like that like I never really had any established friends until I got back uh to like the Philadelphia area when I was about 12 years old so everything leading up to that was just like jumping around jumping around and I mean didn't bother me at the time you know i was just young and had you know having a good time and doing all that stuff so yeah well it was uh 
I was going to school. I wasn't homeschooled. They figured it out some way because I don't Florida and Utah and Pennsylvania, they all have different school systems, different school years. So I get I was able to just whenever I went, just able to pick up and roll through and you know, somehow I made it. <laughs> <laughs> right okay well that's interesting I, I had no idea about that um so speaking of your dad uh i'd like to because you just mentioned before you that you know that your dad is a very intelligent man what other like what misconceptions might there be about your dad out there um because you know everyone always kind of believes because his character was very believable and he did a very good job uh, as a performer uh, what would you say would be some misconceptions out there that people don't realize about your dad Oh, wow. Um, misconceptions. Uh, well, it, they all started. So when he started off, he was, you know, Mr. Sandman, whatever, carrying the surfboard around with the, you know, wetsuit and everything like that. And, you know, he was when he first started off, he was traveling around and he was working like Jerry Lawler, like every night for like 30 nights a week, like down in Tennessee and everything like that. Not many people know, like his background and stuff like that but then they were struggling trying to figure out his character for him and they saw him you know like smoking a cigarette drinking a beer in the back and they said you know why don't we just let him go do, do that like just be him you know so it's not really much misconception of like the character now he was he's not like a belligerent drunk all day every day like but <laughs> he just he, he liked to have his stuff and then he, he took that idea of the character and then just ran with it. So, but yeah, I mean, if you ask anybody in the locker room going through what, I, I mean, if there was a current event happening, if there was anybody had any questions about the news, any history that had to go on, I mean, they were going to him. Like they all knew he was probably one of the most intelligent guys in that locker room. He may not seem about it. It's not too intelligent smashing beer cans on your head for 20 years, but <laughs> you know, it, it, it is what it is. And I mean, hey, look, people didn't come to really watch him wrestle. I mean, he's not a Eddie Guerrero or a Dean Malenko or, a, you know, his character was a barroom brawler and that's what he did. But I think maybe a misconception is that, you know, he wasn't really a good wrestler or like he couldn't wrestle. And I think he's probably better than most people give him credit for considering he was portraying the character that he was now listen i'm telling you I'm, he's not going to go around and give you the arm bar arm drag fucking all that stuff like he's not as technical as a, a lot of other dudes are even today or even back then but i think he can work a little bit better than i think people give him credit for um that being as intelligent as he was and i mean a great father. I mean, you, I don't know if that is a misconception or it's not a misconception, but the guy always took care of his kids, no matter what else is going on in the world. You know, he was careful about that. And, um, that's all I can. Yeah. That's all I can really say about that. I'm not really aware of all the misconceptions. Trust me. I've seen the YouTube videos of him, you know, being out there doing what that, you know, drunk, this, that, whatever. Yeah. Has he ruffled some feathers? Sure. That's not a misconception. Sometimes that shit happens. But as far as all the other stuff, you can't say he never cared about the business and everything like that and uh, and everything else. So, yeah, if you want to if there's any misconceptions that I haven't hit, you can let me know and I could try and answer it. But as no, far as I, I know. Think, uh... No, that was a great answer, bro. I just, uh, yeah, I just wanted everyone out there to, you know, kind of get get that point of view. Uh, and as far as, you know, him as a worker in the ring, uh, yesterday we interviewed a guy by the name of Thumbtack Jack, who was uh, quite a prominent German deathmatch style wrestler. And uh, back in, I think it was 2003, uh, your dad went over to Germany to wrestle. Uh, and he said from that one time he, he worked with your dad, all of a sudden he felt like he started to actually get get it because just being in the ring with your dad for 20 minutes just completely changed his whole perception on on how to perform uh and so like you know so that the, the, i think that's a, an important story to tell that you know it was just one match that he had with him and he learned so much yeah he actually knows about the business a little bit i mean he like i said he started off i think like his first match he was opening up with jerry lawler and 
he's telling me that the two locker rooms are like a hundred yards from each other. They they don't even talk before the match. He's sweating bullets. He can only talk to the ref before the match, you know. And then he started traveling around and working, you know, Jerry every night. But then he has a lot of dudes like Jerry and I mean Dusty Rhodes a lot that he learned from. Um, a lot of guys like that. So he doesn't always sound like he knows what he's talking about, but I think he, he knows a little bit like you just pointed out there. So. Absolutely. Um, so uh, getting back to the, the story, the feud between him and Raven, um, I wanted to know, like, uh, you know, I know it's a long time ago, but um, you've probably watched most of this back. Uh, what would you say out of all the things that you've filmed, all those vignettes and the, the things like the birthday party, the, the shitty birthday party that Raven put on for you, <laughs> Blue Mini tries to <laughs> tries to entertain you and you tell him he sucks or whatever it is that went, went on there. Uh, what, like, what are some of your fondest memories and moments, uh, you know, when you look back and watch this stuff? Well, so, I mean, ma I mean, mainly just the main thing I take away from it is like when I look back on it is like just like being a part of the whole thing as a whole in general like it's crazy when you look back on it and I'm like man I really didn't live like your typical six seven year old you know childhood like and I didn't realize that at the time but when I look back I'm like man I was so fortunate to like just even experience that sort of thing and to see what ECW turned into, like, eventually how, I mean, it changed the wrestling business, like, forever, the way, you know, that stuff happened. But, I mean, like you said, the birthday party, I mean, that was at my house. I mean, the ECW, they came there, set the whole thing up. I mean, that was, <laughs> it was hysterical the way the whole thing was set up. Like, we couldn't just, we were just all just dying laughing. I mean, the meanie was just had us rolling on the floor. Like, we couldn't even, I don't even know how we got it done. But, like, that, the very first, like, the very first time that I showed up, you know, and said, Daddy, you're a drunk. Now I worship Raven. Like, stuff like that. Like, I have house shows uh, where I'm Kanan, uh, I think I'm Kanan Dreamer, I think it is in the back of like one of the house shows and he comes back and he's got welts all over his back and he's like jesus kid like why didn't but you know he was messing around you know but you know just little stuff like that i mean bef like before the shows i'd be in the ring you know me and my daddy would be wrestling or i'd be wrestling around with the guys like they i mean all those dudes are just super cool you know and i'm watching them on tv and i like and it's like nobody's busy. Like I'm in there messing with them in the ring. Like they're wrestling with me. Like, you know, it's just good times like that with those good dudes, like that I'll never forget, you know, and those guys all treated me, you know, well, everybody was awesome. Like to the Dudleys, to, you know, Guido, to Mikey Whipwreck, to Tommy, to Raven, to, Everybody there, I don't, I don't really have a bad word to say about. So, just that and being there like every week, every weekend, being able to see those guys was like basically a second family to me. Like I know those guys, like I, you know, I love those guys. So, you know, nothing too in particular. I mean, because it all kind of runs together for me. I mean, you're going show after show after show, and you're kind of almost doing the same thing almost every night because you're not like live on TV. You don't have Twitter people like saying, you know, yeah, record it, recording it and so on what's going on. So like we're kind of doing almost kind of the same thing like every you know house show that we're doing. But yeah, just generally speaking, I mean, being able to do that and be with the guys and be with my family and the whole, you know, my ECW wrestling family is just awesome and an experience that I'll obviously never forget. Yeah, bro. Like I was just thinking then as you're talking about it, it's like you've got a bunch of uncles and aunties and they all, <laughs> <laughs> all these yeah. misfits. It's, uh, it really is really cool, man. Like, uh, I, I, cause I kind of think back to like when I was a kid, cause I, I think I'm only two years older than you. Um, or maybe three years, um, but my dad used to own a hotel. So like I was always the one kid that was hanging out there, not even just during the day, but through to the night until midnight, everyone's, you know, drunk and drinking and partying. And, and there's this, this little kid running around the hotel having fun and 
and everyone was really nice to me. So that's just a comparison I could make, the closest I could make anyway. <laughs> well, no, it, it makes sense completely because when I, well, so when I wasn't like doing the whole on camera thing, like obviously I'm at all the shows and I'm, you know, running around all the arenas and stuff like that. And the good, and like the thing about that is that my mom and dad, as crazy as ECW fans were and shows were and everything like that, like they never had to worry about me because I was just roaming around, but they knew that eyes were always like, everybody knew who I was, like the security, like I was real cool with the security, like Ron from, uh, from Atlas security, all those dudes like kept on me. And like, then after I was on the camera and everything like that, all the fans knew who I was. So like, the fans would kind of like look after me. You know what I'm saying? It was it, as weird as it sounds like everybody knows like my my dad and my mom were like, he can go wherever he want because he's going to be taken care of. Like, you know, I, I wasn't a bad kid. So like, but, you know, when New Jack's like throwing dudes to the fucking thing, like, you know, they're going around the whole stadium and doing that whole thing and I'm following them going like everybody, you know, like, so everybody's <laughs> making sure like I'm not getting hurt, like stuff like that. So it's kind of like the hotel thing. Like you were talking about, it's like, everybody knows who you are, but like, everybody's like, you know, keeping an eye up. Like there's some crazy shit going on, but you know, he's safe, you know, and everybody was looking out for each other. And that was a great thing about ECW that, you know, those guys were all great dudes and everybody just looked out for each other. And it was, it was a good time. That's excellent, bro. That's uh, like so many people out there right now are real jealous. And uh, after hearing that, what a fun childhood, at least for that time that you were uh, performing on the shows. And that's just really, really awesome. Um, uh, but moving forward, uh, I know this is probably maybe another kind of toughish question, but you're, you're a kid. So I don't know if this question is going to work, but we'll say, do you feel like, what, what would you have learned most about your mum and dad during this time, um, being with them, seeing them perform so close up? Learned as in what, do you think? Like, about them. Like, is there something about them that you, that you might have felt like you learned uh, that, that might, maybe you didn't prior by performing with them? Um... I don't think, I mean, <clears throat> until my mom did it, I never would have thought that, you know, she was capable, even though I guess I thought I was capable. So I don't know why I don't think that she'd be able to do it. But uh, even though she was kind of, she was, came out with my dad, like before when he was doing the whole surfboard thing, which I'm not sure I was aware of at the time. Um, but no, I mean, a lot of it, what, I mean, my dad is, you, you know, you get what you see. I mean, he wasn't much different than, you know, his in-ring character. I mean, he obviously wasn't coming home, you know, doing the cigarettes, the Singapore King, you know, drink. But as far as, you know, um, like teaching me things and, you know, like having me grow up and all that other stuff. I mean, they were pretty much the same people. I mean, you, you can't. I guess you can't try and have me go to and watch ECW shows every night. And then when we get home, it's like, Hey, you know, I'm tucking you in at bed at 8 PM, you know, like, yeah, I don't, I don't really think that works that way. So it was kind of like, you see what you get. And we were just that type of family. And that's just what worked for us. Like we were a wrestling family. Like we traveled, we had fun. Like, obviously there was, obviously there were rules. I was a kid, but you know, it wasn't like, Hey, we're going to keep you up till 2 a.m. at a show because, you know, dad's got it. Dad's last in the promo line, you know, so after the show. So, you know, I'm staying there till 3 a.m. And then like during the week, it's like eat your vegetables, you know, tuck in at 8 p.m. Like, it's, you know, <laughs> so it was kind of like what you see is what you get. And I mean, nothing really nothing really changed. Awesome, bro. Um, I wanted to talk about your mum for a minute here because some of the things that I've seen her do in ECW 
it all it like I've been watching some of uh, the year two thousand uh, ECW um, recently, and some of the stuff that she did, uh, especially with Rhino, I thought were insane. And I, uh, man, she took those things like a champion. I have to say, um, <laughs> when you watch that, because because to you, Tyler, that's the shit, your mum's your mum, you know. And, and for me, like you know, I think about my mum, and then <laughs> seeing your mum take. A, a gore through a table and it's he hits her with it and 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 the pile driver off the ring apron through a table is one of the most confronting images i think i've ever seen uh in ecw when you see stuff like that your mum doing that even years later does it you know how do you, does that make you feel it you know it's crazy because i think at the time i was like you know because i think I want to say it was the spear. I want to say it was the spear through the table that I was actually in the front row with her at. I want to say it was me and my sister. So, you know, they're going over this whole thing, and you know, they're like, "All right, you know, like, Lori, you know, like, we're gonna, you know, you cool with, you know, getting the spirit, like, whatever." And of course, my dad's like, "Oh, it'll be great for TV. You should do it, blah blah blah, you know, whatever." And I think at the time, I'm like. Oh, you know, it's, you know, it's wrestling, you know, my dad does like, it is what it is. And then like years later, I look back on it and I watch and I'm like, man, he fucking killed her. Like, how did she not break in half? Like, I'm like, damn, I'm like, all right, mom, like, holy shit. Like, you know, like but when, when I was a kid, I'm like, oh, it's just wrestling. You know, everybody goes through tables. Like it is what it is. Like <laughs> it is what it is. Like whatever. But like w- watching it back, I, I like, I'd actually talk to my mom and be like, damn, he killed you on it. Like how the hell did you get? And honestly, she was like the, the pile driver through the table. She was like, I didn't even feel like it was yeah. all good. Like I, Rhino took such good care of her on that, you know, like, she was like, I didn't even feel the spear. I don't know. He looks like he breaks her in goddamn half. I don't know how the hell she got up. That was brutal. She folded like a freaking lawn chair, like an accordion. But I mean, she, she was great and she was fine. Like she was never hurt. Anything that like they always took care of her. You know, I, you can't. It's hard to take care of somebody on a spear through a table. But but uh, as far as like the pile driver knows uh, goes, I know for sure that she was like, nope, I didn't feel a thing. You know, like he took care, like not a single thing. And it just looks like you get killed. But yeah, like I said, at the time, I'm like, yeah, you know, it's just wrestling. You know, mom, you know, dad does it. Mom's got to do it, whatever. But yeah, when I look back on it, I'm like, oh, shit. Like, that was brutal. I actually have some perspective on it. I'm like, damn, that looked good. Like, yeah, so. Yeah, well, like I've seen him spear a lot of people through uh, the table in the corner, and I think that's that's the best one as far as I'm concerned because the way that the table snapped as well, it was just like this clean. Uh, it was perfect. Oh, break and she breaks right in hand. Like it's you can't get it to look any better than that, really. No, no chance. Um, <laughs> uh, fast forwarding a little bit, I just wanted to get your thoughts. You know, you're 11 years old at the time, I believe. ECW ends up closing its doors in January of 2001. Um, you know, looking back, how does that make you feel? You know, uh, how did you, what was your perspective in, in the household with your dad? Um, you know, what did you think of that? Um, so probably, so around that time, um, you know, stuff that's going on. And then like, at the time, I'm not really, I don't really realize like the whole financial ramifications of like the business, you know, I'm just kind of like, uh, you know, it's, it's no more, like it's not, you know, and so like, I didn't really like understand it, like at the time, you know, and of course, like my dad would like try and like explain it to me, but you know, I still, I was just like, what do you mean? It, it's got to go on forever. Like it's ECW, like it can't just like stop, like that doesn't happen, you know, so like, and it was definitely different. It was definitely different, um, you know, but as I got older, I was able to, like, understand a little bit more, you know, and then once CCW stopped, then you start doing, like, more independent stuff like Ring of Honor and, like, all the other independent shows. You start going this, that, and the other. 
and then after that, I guess it's, you know, year, I guess, oh, five, I think was the f- first one night stand or something like that. So it had been about like four or so years until that happened. And then they started with the rebrand on, you know, WWE, like a year or two after that. But it was definitely different because, but it's, but, but it wasn't too different because, a lot of the guys from ECW when my dad was doing independent shows are on the same independent shows, you know, guys who hadn't went to like WCW or WWE, you know, after, you know, permanently. So like, I was still seeing the same guys and stuff like that, but I mean, it didn't have the same feel as like ECW, but I mean, I was still so young. So I was just kind of just happy, you know, doing my thing and, you know, just living life at that time. Right, yeah, because I just thought that'd be interesting because, you know, obviously when you were six, you were performing on the shows, but I would still imagine as the years went by, you would still go with your dad to the shows and, and be around all the wrestlers. And uh, it's almost like you, and, I, and I've said this to other, you know, people that were wrestlers in the company at the time, like you had this family that you saw every week, no matter what. And then all of a sudden that wasn't there anymore. So it must yeah. be, you know, it must be hard. Like I spoke to Jim Molino about this and, you know, you have this family and now you don't get to see them as much anymore when you used to. For a kid, it must have been a little, you know, kids can be very uh, emotional, you know what I mean? And and, and right. uh, things like that can really feel like a real big loss to you. Um, did, did you ever kind of feel like that? Well, I think I think I was still a little bit like too young to understand because when you're older, you're like, oh, man, something great, like just ended like, you know, like something like we will never have that back again, probably Mm. like at the time, you know, so when I'm young, I'm still going to like I'm still going to shows like my dad's still booked on all these independent shows. And like I said before, a lot of the same those same guys, these guys are running on those independent shows. So it wasn't too different for me you know still being like i was a little bit older but i was still like you know 11 12 years old so i'm still like oh you know i'm still around the guys it's ecw you know even though the you know call letters aren't ecw on the apron the ring apron or like whatever like for me i'm just like oh you know it's you know doring and roadkill and you know guido and mamaluke and balls and new jack it's it's my boys like diva and bubba like it's my boys so like I don't think anything really too different okay. about it, I guess, when I was younger. But the more I got older, I was like, damn, I miss those days. Like, yeah. then, you know, not as when I began to, like, realize, what, you know, what we had and what actually was going on. I'm like, damn, those were the days. Like, that was awesome. So definitely when I got older, it was more like a reminisce, like, look back, like, oh, man, those – good old ECW days, like, no, nothing will beat that again. So, yeah, the more, the older I, the older I got, the more, like, in tune I got with, you know, missing it, you know, when it was gone. Fair enough, bro. Um, So you did mention ECW One Night Stand. The questions that I have for this are, were you there? Did you get to witness this? And uh, if you were, did it feel the same way despite it being produced by WWE? Yeah, so I was there at the Hammerstein Ballroom in New York, uh, 2005. So I got to be 15, 16 years old at that point. Um, and, I mean, it was great. Uh, you know, all the boys back together, like, you know, and a lot of them hadn't seen me in probably in a good amount of years. And they're like, you know, holy crap, dude, like, you got old. Or, like, you know, you grow up. Like, I was just this little bleach blonde haired you know snot nosed <laughs> kid and, uh now i'm a little bit older and it, it was just it's great to see everybody you know then and dude the it had that it had that ecw feel because like it was all you know the same workers and stuff like that but the crowd was what made it feel ecw mm. again you know like because you a lot of the a lot of the ECW fans are still going to like those independent shows, but like, and they're good, and those like crowds are good and real good, but you're not getting like the same vibe. But like 
when that show start like that vibe and that building the hammerstein is dude like the people are right on top of you and it's like you can just feel the energy and feel everything like that the crowd was really what made it like feel ecw and you know they were a huge part of it absolutely it was magic it was magic the the dvd uh the rise and fall sells tremendously uh the pay-per-view does very well the people want ecw and and uh, the next year they they're going to bring it back um <laughs> look, i like having guests on the show um especially ones that were ecw uh talk shit about how wwe screwed it up uh from your perspective <laughs> How disappointing is it that, you know, gosh, all they needed to do was just let Tommy and Paul do their thing, hit the same towns, do the same loops in, in those small, like, uh, convention center type places where the atmosphere is great because, you know, it, it's packed to the rafters in there. It's ECW authentic. And then it ends up being like an afterthought uh, taped before SmackDown and it just doesn't feel the same way what's your perspective on on how uh they screwed this up yeah i mean you basically just laid it out there i mean ev everything that you said is not wrong and uh, now and i don't know how much vince would have ever done any of that stuff because vince probably wouldn't have been able to take credit for it and that's probably what he he wanted to be able to take credit for you know bringing ecw back and stuff but it it that just that just wasn't Vince like he wasn't gonna go to smaller venues and do it because it was a smart thing to do like he he owned the wrestling business so basically at the time so he was gonna do whatever he wants you know pass or fail it, he was gonna do what he wanted because it didn't matter there was nobody nobody there to challenge him as far as like another company or anything like that so didn't really matter and i don't know if he wanted it to fail like on purpose like just to say hey listen like i told you it wouldn't work or but like i have no idea if that's the type of thing but yeah it definitely wasn't the same feel same vibe i mean could it have worked in the bigger stadium and like stuff like that i guess if you had the right like talent the right booking like the right everything i mean i i guess maybe it could have worked but when you start having guys like christian be like your ecw champion or like and that's no offense to him like he's yeah. doing good work you know that's just not the type of guy that like ecw really like was or ecw fans are going to look at and be like go christian you know like it's just <laughs> yeah. like and it's not and it's not just him it's like other guys like you know part of that like company too and stuff like that it just it was just a big miss you know misjudged thing from the beginning and everything that you said to open is i can't really argue with and i don't really have much to add to other than <laughs> <laughs> no, fair enough, bro. But yeah, I just uh, wanted to bring that up. Um, was there a time, you know, uh, as you're getting towards 17, 18 years old, because I have done some research and have seen that you've performed in a couple of matches, but I, I don't know if my research is just like, it's the internet can be difficult to get information sometimes. Um, so I don't know if you did wrestle quite a few matches. All I found were five. So you can correct me if I'm wrong there, but um, did you start training to be a wrestler? So, I mean, my whole life, I mean, my dad had a wrestling gym where I got, I want to say I was probably around like 10 to 12 years old. He had, he had bought a bar. He had bought a, like a bar slash restaurant and there was a wrestling, uh, there was a wrestling school in the back of it. So, I was like 10, 12 years old and I'm like teaching dudes how to like lock up, do all this other stuff. Like my dad would be like, here, lock up with him, like pointing to me. And they'd be like, be like 25 year old dudes, like looking at like, you serious? Like he'd be like, yeah, you know, lock up with him. So I never like, you know, really like formally, like formally trained, but just my whole life, like growing up, like watching it, like doing stuff with my dad. Like my dad obviously taught me a bunch of stuff. Um, 
uh, as far as like, you know, uh, in ring wrestling and stuff like that. But I never really had like formal, formal training. So, and there came a point where I was like, yeah, hey, you know what, like me, you know, maybe this is something I'd like to do. So I'll try it. And like you said, I, I can't tell you off the top of my head. I would say maybe like 10 matches max I've probably had. Um, but I mean, it never really got too, too serious. Like it was things that I was going on, like me and my dad were doing tag team matches from time to time, like stuff like that. I did like some single matches myself and I don't, it just never really like came to fruition. I never really like followed, followed through with it. I mean, it's, it's definitely something that like I love, like I love the wrestling business. I always will. It just hasn't really like gone into you know, playing as far as like me tackling that as like a profession per se. So, but yeah, you're not too far off. If you came across five, I would say between probably five and 10 is probably max matches that I've had. Okay. Fair enough. I just thought it was important to bring it up because there's one thing here I found in my research. And again, sometimes the internet can lie. It says that your in-ring debut was the 23rd of August, 2008 for pro wrestling unplugged. Wrestling as Twisted Sand, Tyler Fullington. Your first match was a street fight with King of Queens actor Kevin James. Is that correct? <laughs> uh, it was against Kevin James, but that wasn't the King uh, Kevin James was, I, I, which is still hilarious. <laughs> but I'm still up there today, and like nobody's <laughs> that. ten years. It, dude, I thought that was the funniest thing ever because <laughs> my buddies were like, dude, you wrestled Kevin James? Like, the dude. <laughs> and I'm like, no, like, where'd you get that from? Like, and they saw, <laughs> they show me the clip and I'm like, geez, like, who the hell messed this up real bad? <laughs> and uh, poor Kevin James is somebody like asking if they, he had a death match or something at like one of his like screenings or for like a movie or something. But, no, nah, it was a different Kevin James, uh, <laughs> a professional wrestler, Kevin James. Um, and, yeah, it it went well. It was good. I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily say it was like a death match, but, I mean, there was, you know, a couple cane shots and stuff involved and stuff like that. It was good. It was fun. And, yeah, that was it. But, no, it was not the actor, Kevin James, who <laughs> I enjoyed So. Uh, I, I have a I have a theory that somebody probably went on your Wikipedia article, saw that it said that you had your debut match against Kevin James, and then some like they just cheekily like edited the article and said that it was the the actor. I reckon that's what. Hey, if it was somebody trying to put me up for a huge, I appreciate it, but you know it's not that good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another important moment in history I'd like to bring up, which I thought was really cool, uh, June twenty seventh, two thousand nine. Uh, Legends of the Arena, a show at the old ECW Arena. Uh, apparently, again, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, yourself and your younger brother Oliver interfered in the main event, uh, helping your dad and Sabu defeat Raven and Just Incredible. Oh, God. Um, that, that sounds familiar. Um, and to be honest with you, I... I couldn't really tell you any specifics off of it. I mean, uh, like I said, it sounds familiar. I can't remember specifically. I mean, I've done so many, like, in-ring, like, things and stuff like that, like run-ins, like, you know, with my little brother, like, my sister at times. Like, so, like my dad's always just had us involved in his matches. Like, I don't know what. I guess he just really likes it or whatever. I don't know why, but he always has something going. Even if it's, you know, uh, an indie show with 30 people there or it's a pay-per-view at ECW, like, he's trying to involve me or whoever in it, like, all the time. So that one, I I don't think I can really give you any insight on because I can't really remember specifically about it. <laughs> That's okay, bro. Not a problem. Uh, another another thing that I found, and again, you know, if you remember, if you don't, that's fine. And please, again, tell me if it actually happened. 26th of uh, September 2009, Pro Wrestling Unplugged. Apparently, you faced your father in a match that went to a no contest at the Boyles World Gym in Philly. 
Um, is that true? Okay, so yes. All right, I do remember this one. So, uh, so I went, I think, I don't know, it was like a month or so before that show or whatever. Like I win a Royal Rumble or Battle War or whatever, you know, and I get to like, you know, handpick my opponent or whatever. So I obviously call out my dad, everything, every, you know, the person that's taught me everything in the wrestling business. So call him out, blah, blah, blah. blah. And when I guess, I don't know, it's like a month or two later at, at the show and we're going to have this match. And we're going over to match this, that, and the other. And so I go out. I'm waiting for him. Music hits. You know, I don't really see him. I'm waiting for him. You know, obviously, I'm looking all over the arena. I still don't see him. I see, you know, whatever. And then he shows up into the ring, at, and I didn't even see him. And he's got, like, a hooded sweatshirt on. He's, like, all, like, kayfabe. Like, he's whatever. And basically, he doesn't want to wrestle me. You know, because I'm his son. He doesn't want to wrestle me, everything like that. So, and I'm ready because I'm trying to, like, you know, test my test my skills against the big man, you know. So, and um, it turns out, you know, Raven has a run-in. You know, my dad, like, scatters out of the ring. Raven has a run-in. DDTs me and leaves me laying on the mat. And he just goes into the back. And that's basically how the match ended. And which was supposed to set up me, me versus Raven, then. Oh, but but that never actually ended up happening. I don't know why or what for. Maybe the company you know wasn't around anymore or anything like that. But we were setting something up where Raven interferes in the you know between me and my dad, leaves me laying, and then that sets up like me and Raven something you know so we can keep like kind of like a triangle going. Like we were trying, that's kind of where we were heading with it. So like me and my dad were like, dude, we shouldn't even have that, you know, keep, keep the guests coming back. Yeah. You know, Cause if, if me and my dad have a match, I mean, what's the, what's the end point to that? You know, I win and it's whatever or he wins. It's what, you know, so we were trying to set something up for like the next show and like, you know, keep it going and keep the people intrigued. And, you know, the next show just never ended up happening. Oh, that's a shame because I, you know, I was thinking earlier, wouldn't it have been great if there was um, a, a platform or at least a company where both your dad and Raven were uh, under contract and all these years later, we, we get Tyler Fullington actually get to be in the ring and actually fight Raven. I just thought that that would be such a, a beautiful, like, story coming full circle kind of thing. Um, so shame it didn't get to happen, but... Um, hey, never say never, right? <laughs> that's right bro you never know um <laughs> uh all right well that kind of brings us towards like the near the end of the interview here bro um i i want to thank you for your time it's been like it's been really fun getting to know your perspective of your time in the wrestling business uh, but we have one final segment on the show here tyler it's called five second frenzy you have five seconds to answer each question even if you don't make the five seconds it's okay it's you're not going to get in trouble um but it's supposed to be quick fire <laughs> <laughs> quick fire one after another who is your favorite wrestler my favorite wrestler is probably the rock excellent excellent um i know you only had 10 matches but you know who would you say would have been your favorite opponent uh, that you faced when you did wrestle or even if someone that you did a run in on who would be someone that you you like to uh uh oh wow um god that's tough uh i guess i would just say my one of my dad's matches because I'd, I'd have to i'd be going over to five second buzzer if i had to think a little bit harder but yeah i'll just say my dad <laughs> um so in your time you know in ecw being a kid watching the shows is there one match that you think back on one match that you saw that we would say would be your favorite match or memory of, of witnessing? Uh, wow, there's so many good ones. Um, but I, I guess I'll go with the I guess I'll go with the the last one. I guess it was uh, Massacre at 34th Street when it's my dad, Ryan, or it's my dad, Steve Carino, and Just Incredible. The ladder match for the uh, for the belt and um at the hammer sign and uh i mean just because it was that you know last final 
ECW met, you know, and then Rhino yeah. comes out and takes the belt from him. But yeah, so I, I probably have to go with that just because it's just the final conclusion of, you know, of it all. Absolutely, man. That's a good answer. Um, getting away from wrestling now, your favorite book. Oh, God. Uh, I'm still working on it, but I really like the book of power. Excellent. Um, yeah, it's uh, a lot of things that help you in any different scenario, you know, stuff like that. It's not not all good, but it definitely gives you a good mindset uh, moving forward in life. Cool. Um, favorite TV show? Uh, uh, probably Game of Thrones. Nice. I mean, I know it's I know it's no longer on anymore, but I mean, I've definitely watched it all the way through, like at least two times, and I'm definitely wanting to watch it again. And I know the new prequel season's coming out soon, so that was probably the best show I've seen. So yeah, I'd say Game of Thrones. Excellent, bro. That sounds like me with The Sopranos. I think I've seen that three times through already <laughs> probably ready for another go around soon uh, favorite film I'm, work I'm working on the sopranos I, oh, good I'm, good i'm getting there so i'll let you know how i make it out excellent bro um what would you say would be your favorite favorite film <clears throat> wow gosh that's so hard there's so many good ones i mean i guess i guess i'll say because there's so many of them i don't really have like a favorite favorite but one that whenever it's on the television i always turn on is shawshank redemption um i mean you can't ever go wrong with that movie i mean so but i mean i'm sure there's a hundred that i'm missing but i'll just say that off the top of my head Right. Yeah. You know, like how uh, when Ric Flair has these uh, moments where there's like, you know, a dedication to him in the ring and he always cries. That's like me with movies. I, I kind of feel like I'm like him and I, I will I will burst into tears over the smallest thing. Sure, Shank Redemption ruined me the first time I saw it when he finally <laughs> was free. I was like, like it was raining in the scene and it was raining on my face as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, like I said, anytime it's on, I don't care if I've seen it a hundred thousand times, I gotta put it on. That's why I that's why I said I, I guess I'd have to choose that one. I mean, it's a great, great movie if you haven't seen it. Yeah. Um, and I hope it didn't spoil the ending there for a lot of people who haven't seen it yet. But you're good. It, what ending? They, yeah. they, they 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 should they should have seen it by now anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they've had <laughs> um, what would you say is your favorite mu musical artist or band? Oh, wow. I mean, I get, I mean, I think pro probably Michael Jackson. I can't go wrong with Michael Jackson. I mean, the king of pop, greatest. I mean, you put on anything Michael Jackson in any scenario and you're going to have people moving. So and I can't argue with that. Yeah. Good call, bro. Uh, getting away from the arts now, what's your favorite food? Favorite food? Uh, I'm a real big chicken and dumplings guy. Mm. Love that great chicken and dumplings. I can't go wrong with that. I mean, I could have said pizza. You know, everybody loves pizza. It's kind of like their favorite. But nah, chicken and dumplings for me, I I can't go wrong with. Excellent, bro. I love dumplings as well. Uh, what would you say your favorite place to eat on the road is, uh, is or you know, your favorite restaurant? Favorite restaurant. You know what I love, and I can like eat anywhere it's like a nice like hibachi where they like cook in front of you that that steak shrimp all that stuff the fried rice that dude you can't go wrong with hibachi i mean i'll eat there probably seven days a week if i could so <laughs> i probably have to say i, I could do that <laughs> nice choice uh three to go tyler what's your favorite alcoholic beverage probably rum yeah, I'm a rum man. It doesn't matter. Captain Morgan, you, I mean, you name it. Anything rum is probably my favorite. Nice, nice. Uh, second last one, Tyler, the naughtiest one of Five Second Frenzy. What's your favorite female body part? Uh, what you want the PG version or do you want the uh, no, nah, I honestly, I mean, I, I really like women's eyes. I mean, they will kind of get me when I when I'm looking at a woman. I'm just like if you have really like gorgeous eyes, that'll 
that'll really, you know, like melt me and be like, oh man, like it just defines you. Cause you can look into a woman's eyes and see how true and genuine she is, you know, typically. So yeah, I would say that. That's a tremendous answer, bro. Uh, and the last one for five second frenzy. I don't know. I don't think you've, you've cursed once on this uh, interview, um, but what is your favorite curse word? You gotta go fuck, right? I mean, <laughs> you, you can't go wrong. I mean, you could say that with anything. So it's, you just throw that out there and people know, you know, people know you mean business or you're upset or whatever. I mean, it's, that's probably my favorite, obviously. Excellent, Tyler. Well, well, Tyler Fullington, this has been an awesome experience for me to talk to you here today and learn a little bit about your life, learn a little bit about you and your experiences uh, with ECW and outside of it as well. Um, and, you know, I always say it because, uh, you know, I live in the most isolated city in the world, Perth, Western Australia. And, you know, for you to have that reach all the way over here, when you, you're six years old, I was jealous that you got to be on TV, but you did such a good job. And I want to say this right here, right now. I know there hasn't been many of them, but as far as I'm concerned, any kid that was involved in a professional wrestling product, you were without a doubt the best performer of them all. You didn't have any training on how to act or anything, but you did a fantastic job as far as I'm concerned. And everyone's always going to remember little Tyler Fullington. Well, I mean, that means a lot, man. I appreciate that. Thank you. And like I said, I I was just a little kid. I mean, I got to give credit to everybody else who was in those matches. I mean, putting me in the right positions and helping me out and, you know, telling me my lines and, you know, put me in the right positions and doing everything like that. So, you know, to, you know, my dad, my mom, my stepdad, Raven, you know, uh, Blue Meanie, Stevie Richards, Nova. I mean, the it goes on and on. Tommy Dreamer, like, it's countless amounts of dudes that actually made me, you know, be successful when I was in there. So, I mean, I appreciate your kind words, but majority of it should go to them. Excellent, bro. Well, again, Tyler, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Anytime. No worries, bro. And uh, so thank you to Tyler Fullington and thank you everyone out there for watching the Insider's Edge podcast here on the WZWA Network in conjunction with Blue Wire Hustle. I'm your host with the most on the West Coast, California and Fury, and we will see you next time. Thank you.